Okay, welcome back to the course on natural language processing. Today we're going to start the section on syntax. I'm going to introduce uh, grammars and syntax in the next few segments. So one of the fundamental questions in linguistics is whether language is just a bag of words. We know that it is not because if we rearrange the words in a sentence we're going to get uh, most of the time nonsense. Syntax turns out to uh, mean that uh, grammatical rules exist and then they apply to categories and groups of words, not individual words. So for example, a sentence can include a subject and a predicate. The subject can be typically a noun phrase and the predicate is a ver verb phrase. So here's some examples of noun phrases, the cat, Samantha or she, uh, some examples of verb phrases, for example, arrived, went away, and had dinner. We can combine any of those noun phrases with any of the verb phrases and form a syntactically correct sentence. For example, we can say the cat went away or Samantha had dinner. So when people learn a new word, before they can use it in a sentence, they have to learn its uh, syntactic role. Uh, for example, if I tell you that wug is a noun, you can immediately create sentences such as I can see two wugs here or I don't like wugs. If I tell you that Cluvius is an adjective, you can immediately create a sentence that says something like this, I don't like Cluvius people. I'm not saying that those sentences make sense, but they are at least syntactically correct. I actually wanted to come up with more examples of artificial words for this slide. Uh, Wug was actually created by uh, Bleason uh, many years ago as an example, and Cluvius comes from a problem that I designed for NACLO a few years ago. I tried quite a few other words, uh, however, it turns out that most of the things that I came up with, even though they didn't sound like words in English, turned out to exist in uh, uh, some dictionaries of slang, and in many cases they meant uh, very bad things. I don't want to repeat them here in front of you. So let's see now how we can define parts of speech uh, from a syntactic point of view. The first thing is nouns. Those are the most common type of words. Uh, what do they all have in common? One of the properties that most nouns typically have is that they can be preceded by the word the. So I can say the cat or the house. What about verbs? Well, verbs have also different properties. One is that they cannot be preceded by the word the, like nouns, but they can be preceded by can't. So for example, sleep is a verb and it can be preceded by the word can't. I can say can't sleep. What are adjectives? Well, adjectives are the words that come between the and the noun. I mean, this is not the only property of adjectives, but this is one that holds for them. So I can say the Cluvius wug. Well, this is slightly different from the high school definitions or the grade school definitions that you're familiar with. In that case, nouns were defined to be things and concepts and ideas and verbs were actions. So from a syntactic point of view, uh, we are more interested in the way that the words can form sentences rather than uh, the meaning of the individual words. Uh, we can similarly define other categories of parts of speech, for example, determiners and prepositions, uh, which we have seen before. So one of the fundamental concepts in syntax is called the constituent. Constituents are continuous pieces of text. They're non-crossing. So if two constituents share any word at all, then one of the two constituents must completely contain the other one. And then uh, each word is a constituent in itself. And the role of constituents is that uh, any uh, set of, any sequence of words that is part of the same constituent can be replaced with any other member of that constituent and still form a grammatically correct sentence. So for example, she, Samantha, and the cat can all be considered noun phrases. And that is one of the simplest types of constituents. So there are many types of constituent tests that you can find in the linguistics literature. I'm going to run through some of them here and give you examples of them. So the first one is the coordination test. I need to warn you that all of those tests are just used as examples and they can be all violated, but in principle if uh, two words pass multiple tests, chances are very high that the two words or phrases, I guess, uh, belong to the same constituent type. So the coordination test uh, tells us that if we combine two constituents uh, with a conjunction. That means they're, for, they're of the same type. We can also have the pronoun test. If I can replace a small dog, a whole unit in this sentence with the word it, that means that the unit is a constituent. 
there's also this very interesting uh, constituent test called question by repetition. Suppose that we have the sentence, I have seen blue elephants, and we want to find out what are the constituents of the sentence. For example, is the sequence of words seen blue a constituent? Or is the sequence of words blue elephants a constituent? Well, the constituent test here is going to tell us the answer. So let's try this little dialogue. I have seen blue elephants. Blue elephants? Well, this sounds like a meaningful dialogue. Therefore, blue elephants is a constituent. But now imagine the second dialogue. I have seen blue elephants. Seen blue? Well, this doesn't look like a plausible dialogue. Seen blue, therefore, is not a constituent. And finally, a third dialogue would be, I have seen blue elephants. Seen blue elephants? Uh, this sounds actually fairly grammatical, and therefore seen blue elephants is also a valid constituent. There is also the topicalization test, which allows you to uh, check if something is a constituent by fronting it at the beginning of the sentence. So instead of saying, I have seen blue elephants, you can say, blue elephants, I have seen, uh, therefore blue elephants is also a constituent. There is also the question test. If you can replace a phrase with some question word like what, uh, that also is an indication that the phrase is a constituent. I have seen blue elephants. What have I seen? What meaning blue elephants? There are many other constituent tests. I'm not going to go through them in a lot of detail. For example, the deletion test, the semantic test, and finally, uh, the simple intuition test. If something looks intuitively like a constituent, it probably is one. So now let's see how we can use uh, tree structures to generate sentences. The simplest algorithm is the following. You have a context-free grammar, which I'm going to explain in a few slides, and then you start from the so-called start symbol of the grammar, you generate a tree structure that matches the grammar, and then you fill the leaf nodes of the tree with terminal symbols such as individual words. So let's see how we can build a sentence like this. So the simplest possible sentence in English is perhaps one that consists of a noun and a verb, something like birds fly. So the notation on the screen tells you that uh, we're trying to generate a sentence, and then the arrow indicates that in order to generate a sentence, we first have to produce a noun and then a verb. So if birds is a noun and fly is a verb, that means that birds fly is a correct grammatical sentence according to this grammar. So this is our simplest grammar, S transforms into NV, N is either Samantha or Main or Jorge, uh, V is either left or sang or walked, and we can produce the following sentences, Samantha sang, Jorge left, or Jorge sang, and so on. Now obviously this grammar is uh, very simple, it's only going to generate two word sentences. We need to expand it. So, so far we only had uh, intransitive verbs, verbs that don't have any direct object. So one possible rule that we want to add to the grammar next is to allow transitive verbs, remember those are the ones that can take direct objects. For example, we can say something like Jorge so Samantha, where Samantha is the direct object of the verb so. We also want to be able to include determiners. For example, say something like the cats, where the is a determiner. Well, it turns out that if you want to add all the possible combinations of constituents that you can have in a sentence, you're going to end up with a very severe case of a combinatorial explosion. So there will be just too many rules, and when you combine them together, they will produce way too many sentences, many of which are not even correct in English, even though they are grammatical according to your grammar. So we need to come up with some ways to combine words into constituents, and then define our uh, syntactic rules in terms of the constituents rather than the words themselves. So for example, we can expand the idea of a noun to be that of a noun phrase, and we can do the same thing for verbs and expand them into verb phrases. So verb phrases would include, for example, the case of individual intransitive verbs, such as walked, or transitive verbs, or ditransitive verbs, uh, verbs with prepositional phrases, verbs with multiple prepositional phrases, and so on. So let's now expand our grammar a little bit. Instead of a noun and a verb, we have a noun phrase and a verb phrase. So S goes to NP followed by VP. NP is the sequence determiner noun, and VP is the sequence verb noun phrase. The determiners here, those are marked with DT, are either the word the or the word a. The nouns are child, cat, and dog, and the verbs are 
took, saw, liked, scared, and chased. So now this uh, grammar is going to produce only noun phrases that start with a determiner. For example, it won't allow us to produce the word Samantha as either the subject or the object. Here are two sample sentences that this grammar generates. Uh, one is a dog chased a cat, and one is the child saw a dog. So there's a way, uh, if the same left-hand side of a transformation rule can generate multiple right-hand sides, instead of writing the rule multiple times, we can just write one rule which has the left-hand side constituent, an arrow, and then all the possible expansions on the right-hand side separated by a vertical bar. The vertical bar indicates a choice or an alternative. So for example, we can have one rule for proper nouns and one for common nouns. So this way we can handle both Samantha as a proper noun, or PN in this case, or we can have the cats, which is DT followed by CN, where CN stands for common noun. So the grammar that we have so far has grown a little bit. S can now produce, again, NP and VP. However, we have two rules for noun phrases, a determiner, a common noun, or a proper noun. Uh, the verb phrase uh, includes a verb and a noun phrase, and now we can have determiners and common nouns and proper nouns, as well as the verbs from the previous example. So now this grammar allows us to produce sentences such as a child scared Jorge or Min took the child. There are many optional categories in uh, grammatical rules. Uh, that means that, for example, we can have noun phrases with adjectives and noun phrases without adjectives. In order to take into account all the possible optional categories, we have to introduce another type of notation, which is parentheses. If we put something in parentheses, that means that it is optional. So let's look at the examples for nouns. One observation that we can make is that whenever N is allowed in a sentence, we can replace it syntactically with the following sequences, any one of them, determiner noun, adjective noun, or determiner adjective noun. For example, if we allow cats, then we allow the cats, we allow small cats, and we allow the small cats. So now we can use the notation for alternatives. Noun phrase uh, produces either N or determiner N or adjective N or determiner adjective N. Or we can just use parentheses. We can say a noun phrase is a sequence that consists of an optional determiner followed by one optional adjective followed by a noun. So this rule here can be equivalent to four different rules, the rule N, the rule DTN, the rule JJN, and the rule DTJJN. Now let's see what we can do with verb phrases. There are many types of verb phrases. We saw some of those in an earlier lecture. Those can contain intransitive verbs, such as ran, as in Samantha, ran. We can have a sentence where we have an intransitive verb and then a prepositional phrase. For example, Samantha ran to the park. We can also have a sentence uh, which only has uh, a particle. Samantha ran away. In this case, away is just a single uh, preposition. We can also have transitive verbs. Samantha bought a cookie. And we can have a transitive verb with a direct object and a prepositional phrase. Samantha bought a cookie for John. So the overall structure of the verb phrase is going to be something like this. It will always start with a verb, but then it will have an optional noun phrase for the direct object. And then it will also have an optional preposition for things like away and an optional noun phrase that follows the preposition. So if we have both the P and the NP that follows it, that means that we would have a, an entire prepositional phrase as part of the verb phrase. So this grammar can now generate uh, the following sentences, Samantha saw the cat, but it can also generate Jorge gave the cat to Min, which has a prepositional phrase in it. So what are prepositional phrases now? Let's look at some examples. Mary bought a book for John in a bookstore. The bookstore sells magazine. The bookstore on Main Street sells magazines. Mary ran away. Mary ran down the hill. So in all those sentences, you can see that every time we have a noun, we can have a prepositional phrase that follows it. So John can be followed by in a bookstore. 
bookstore can be followed by on Main Street. The setting applies to verbs. Every time a verb can be followed by a preposition, like ran away, it can also be followed by a prepositional phrase, ran down the hill. So, in order to accommodate prepositional phrases, we have to allow a new constituent called PP, which can be embedded in either the NP or the VP part of the sentence. And the rule is very simple. Wherever a preposition is allowed, it can be followed by a noun phrase. So, for example, run up versus run up the street. A noun phrase can contain any number of prepositional phrases, but only up to two noun phrases. Uh, so this is only in the case of ditransitive verbs such as uh, Mary gave John a book. So how do we revise now our grammar to take into account uh, prepositional phrases? Well, so far the rules that we have are as goes to NPVP, followed by a rule for noun phrases and a rule for verb phrases, and now we have a rule for prepositional phrases. So a prepositional phrase is a preposition followed by an optional noun phrase. And now for the very first time, we see something that is really important in language. If you look at rule number two here, we can see that a noun phrase can generate a prepositional phrase. And then if you look down at rule number four, you will see that a prepositional phrase can generate a noun phrase. Therefore, we have our first instance of recursion in a grammar. What that means is that we can apply rules two and four in an arbitrarily long sequence and produce extremely long sentences. Here is a good moment to stop for a second and explain uh, the difference that is made by linguists between uh, something called performance and competence. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this uh, principle, but the basic idea is the following. Even though a context-free grammar uh, can produce arbitrarily long sentences that have, let's say, thousands of prepositional phrases embedded in noun phrases, embedded in other prepositional phrases, that doesn't mean that human sentences are that long. People can uh, understand uh, long sentences if they spend a lot of time on them, but they are never going to actually produce them or expect other people to produce them. There's usually a limit of no more than four or five prepositional phrases in a noun phrase. A lot, anything more than that would make the sentence completely incomprehensible. But we can certainly say something like this. I saw John yesterday in the park and perhaps add a few more prepositional phrases at the end, but we're never going to see more than four or five. So now let's see how uh, uh, the problem of prepositional phrase ambiguity, which we have alluded to earlier, can actually be described in a context-free grammar. Let's look at the sentence, the boy saw the woman with the telescope. This sentence is ambiguous because it has two interpretations. The first one is that the boy used the telescope to see the woman. And the second interpretation is that the woman who was uh, carrying a telescope was seen by the boy. Now, uh, in this case, we have a real ambiguity because both of those uh, interpretations make sense in different contexts. Let's look at the grammar that is used to generate the sentence. A prepositional phrase can produce a preposition followed by a noun phrase. And then a verb phrase can also include a prepositional phrase, and a noun phrase can include a prepositional phrase. So there can actually be two different parse trees that correspond to this sentence that produce the PP either as part of the noun phrase or as part of the verb phrase. So we'll look at this problem uh, later on this semester and understand how uh, to deal with it. Uh, one additional symbol that can be used in context-free grammars is the Kleene star. Uh, which is denoted uh, in parentheses in the header of the slide. Uh, it is used to denote a sequence of constituents. So, for example, JJ star means a sequence of zero or more adjectives. Uh, it can be any number of them. It can be seven or ten. It turns out that in English, uh, noun phrases can have multiple uh, adjectives or other so-called pre-modifiers that precede the noun inside the noun phrase. For example, we can say uh, the thin blue line. In this case, thin precedes blue and blue precedes line. So the general structure of a noun phrase can be something like this, a determiner like the followed by some number of adjectives followed by the noun itself. Let's look at a few more examples. We can say a big red house, but we really cannot say a red big house. This sounds really awkward and that's why we've marked it with a star. 
Uh, it's very interesting to think about the order in which adjectives can be uh, put in in the pre-modifier section of a noun phrase. What allows certain uh, sequences and not others? Well, it turns out that in English, adjective ordering uh, in the noun phrase depends on semantics, on the meanings of the individual words. Uh, there has been a lot of work on this uh, subject, and I want to uh, run you through an exercise that will help you understand how this process works. So in this exercise, we're going to look at a few titles of famous uh, songs and books, and we'll try to see if we can find a pattern. So the little red riding hood, three little pigs, the three musketeers, the steadfast tin soldier, the French connection, Old MacDonald, Five Golden Rings, and The Ancient Mariner. If you think about the meaning of each of the individual words, you can figure out that there are certain combinations of meanings that can only appear in a certain order. So we saw in the previous slide that we can use size before color, but we cannot use color before size. So what kind of semantic categories of adjectives do we have in, in those examples here? So little is a size, red is a color, Riding is something like a purpose or designation. The is a determinant, that's not an adjective, and the determinant will always come before the adjectives. Old is about age, golden is material, French is nationality, steadfast is quality, and finally tin is material. So if you try to come up with all the possible combinations of those categories, you will realize that in most cases, you have a very specific ordering of the semantic categories of the adjectives. So here's an example. There may be some exception, exceptions to it, but uh, this is as close as possible to what happens in most sentences. So uh, if you have a determiner, adjectives, and a noun, they're most likely to appear in this order. Determiner first, noun last, and then the adjectives in the middle in the following order. Number, strength, size, age, shape, color, origin, material, and purpose. And uh, you can actually infer this order by looking at the examples on the previous slide and by looking at uh, the partial order that uh, they uh, create. So now let's look at uh, the problem of nested sentences. So a nested sentence is something like this. Birds fly versus I believe that birds fly. So in the second example, Birds fly is nested inside the larger sentence. Here are some more examples. I don't recall whether I took the dog out. Or, do you know if the mall is still open? So, for example, in the first sentence here, the embedded sentence or the nested sentence is, I took the dog out. So, in order to accommodate nested sentences, we need to revise our grammar a little bit. The new rule is this one here. A verb phrase produces a verb followed by zero, one, or two noun phrases. And then we have an optional sequence of C, which is a conjunction, followed by an S, an entire new sentence. So we have, again, a, an instance of recursion because the general rule was that S goes to NPVP, and now we have a rule that VP can produce an S. So we can now, again, recursively alternate between S and VP and produce arbitrarily sentences. So what are the kind of conjunctions that can go into the position of the C? Well, those are the so-called subordinating conjunctions, things like that and whether. Okay, so can uh, the sequence of a subordinating conjunction sentence appear inside a noun phrase? Well, it turns out that it can. And in that case, that also means that we can have a CS sequence as part of the subject of the sentence. Let's look at the example. Whether he will win the elections remains to be seen. The predicate of the sentence is remains to be seen, and uh, the uh, subject is uh, the phrase whether he will win the elections. And we can even verify this syntactically. What remains to be seen? Whether he will win the elections. Or whether he will win the elections remains to be seen, which confirms that whether he will win the elections is the subject of the sentence. So let's go back now to the topic of recursion. S can generate verb phrases, and verb phrases can generate S. Noun phrases can generate prepositional phrases, and prepositional phrases can generate noun phrases. So essentially, recursion allows us to produce really long sentences. But as I mentioned earlier, 
uh, we really cannot designate based on the grammar what is the longest sentence in English. In fact, the grammar would allow us to produce infinitely long sentences. Uh, there are other cases of recursion that appear in grammars. For example, we can have conjunctions of noun phrases. So a noun phrase can be replaced by the sequence noun phrase and noun phrase. For example, I like apples and oranges, where apples and oranges combined is a noun phrase, and also apples by itself is a noun phrase, and oranges by itself is a noun phrase. We can also have conjunctions of prepositional phrases. So PP can uh, be transformed into the sequence PP and PP. And we can do the same thing exactly with verb phrases. For example, I like uh, walking and running. So as you can see, there are some meta patterns that emerge. I'm only going to mention this topic very briefly because it's not really uh, germane to this course. However, uh, I think it's important to understand uh, what the term uh, X-bar theory means. I'm going to introduce it in a second. Let's look at this example here. The sentence can be transformed into a noun phrase, verb phrase sequence. The noun phrase and verb phrase and prepositional phrase have their own roles. So what is the meta pattern? Well, the meta pattern in all of those cases is that we have some sort of a phrase, uh, whether it's a noun phrase, a verb phrase, or a prepositional phrase. XP is the collective name for all of those phrases. And then those phrases can be replaced by something called a specifier. This is what comes before the main part of the phrase, followed by uh, X bar, or, which is sometimes denoted as X apostrophe, like in this example here. And then another portion of this rule tells us that X bar produces X, followed by a complement. So everything before the X bar part is a specifier, everything after it is a complement. So for example, in the noun phrase case, we can have noun phrase produces a determiner followed by N bar. Uh, if you're interested in X bar theory in more detail, uh, there are websites devoted to it as well as a lot of literature uh, in the linguistics community. So now let's look at some meta rules for conjunctions. Uh, we looked earlier at examples of noun phrase and noun phrase and verb phrase and verb phrase and so on. So in the most general case, uh, we have a category X that generates X and X. This kind of rule can be expanded to cover even entire sentences. S produces S and S. For example, it is sunny today and I will go to the park. Uh, what other things can we add to the grammar? Uh, well, uh, one category of particular importance is that of auxiliaries. And we want to see now if auxiliaries uh, pass any of the constituent tests that we looked at earlier. So one thing that we are interested in is, is the sequence auxiliary verb a constituent? For example, in the sentence, I have seen blue elephants and will remember them forever, we have two sequences of auxiliary verbs. And as you can see from the structure of the sentence, it passes the conjunction test. I can say, I have seen blue elephants, period. I will remember them forever. But I can also say, I have seen blue elephants and will remember them forever. So because have seen blue elephants is parallel to will remember them forever, that gives us an indication that those form constituents. So the recursive rule here is going to be something like this. Verb phrase uh, produces auxiliary followed by verb phrase. So we can have a sequence of as many auxiliaries as we want on the left-hand side of the verb. So we can say Raj uh, may have been sleeping, in which case we have three applications of this rule, each time generating an additional auxiliary. Well, is, this, is such recursion unlimited? Well, it turns out that it is not it is limited to a, a few auxiliaries in the verb phrase. Let's look now at an exercise. We have a grammar uh, that is slightly different from the one that we had most recently. It has rules for um, S, NP, VP, PP, as well as uh, a, a, an embedded phrase. So now uh, I want you to do this uh, yourselves. Uh, look at those three sentences and try to generate uh, descriptions of those sentences using the rules in the grammar. 
Uh, the small dog of the neighbors brought me an old tennis ball, is the first sentence. So obviously this is a sentence, therefore we need to start with the row for S. So which uh, right hand side are we going to use, NPVP or CPVP? Well, why don't you think about it uh, and also do the setting for the other two sentences and try to come up with the exact set of rules that are used to generate those three sentences. When you're done, you will have understood uh, the whole idea of parsing. So parsing, which we're going to talk about in the next section in more detail, is the process of taking a sentence and a grammar and coming up with uh, what is known as a parse tree, uh, or which is more or less uh, the set of rules that were used from the grammar to produce the sentence. So this concludes the introduction to syntax. Uh, in the next segment, we're going to look at parsing in more detail.